Hi guys, it's me, Chaser HD, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. Now, of course, this is recorded. It isn't live because Nib, unfortunately, is away uh, this weekend. So we've recorded it, but it's still not going to be um, a massive uh, detractor in terms of the entertainment. We've still got plenty of things to talk about in today's podcast. Before we get in, though, to the topics, I just want to say, guys, if you go into the into the description, sorry, right now and look... You can now vote on the end of season awards for 2018 and the racing that happened in 2018, such as best overtake, uh, best driver, worst driver, stuff like that. You can vote on it right now and the voting will be closed at 12 p.m. UK time on Thursday. So make sure you vote on that and uh, the results will be revealed in a video coming out on the 27th of December. So make sure again you do vote on that but again we do have things to talk about today in today's podcast and as ever joining me for the podcast is Niblo and how are you doing mate? I'm doing very well as usual mate how are you? As good as usual and I cannot wait to get into the topics we're going to get into today so first off and I want you guys watching to get involved as well in the comments whilst we talk about this um, we are going to go through our fantasy F1 calendar. Now, when it comes to this calendar that me and Nib have come up with, um, I've come up with one and he's come up with a different one. Um, it doesn't really matter whether it be realistic or not. At least that's how I've done it. So it doesn't really matter about whether it's realistic or not. So if you want to go for a track that's never ever going to be on the calendar again or ever, then don't worry about it. Put it in um, your calendar. But I will go first off with mine. So my F1 calendar is the first race is Bahrain. The reason I've gone Bahrain is because I think the racing, you know, to start the season, you need to have great racing from the start of the season. And I think Bahrain is a great track to start off a season. And then the second race would be Melbourne. Of course, um, Australia. The third race would be China. And then the fourth race, Baku. But then the start of the European season would not be the Spanish Grand Prix at the Circuit de Catalunya. It would be Estoril, in my opinion. Because I think people forget how great of a track Estoril was. It wasn't easy to pass there. But in terms of the sheer excitement that track brought, the, the high-speed corners... The final corner leading onto the pit straight, it was such a great track. It's never going to come back onto the calendar because it now has a too low of a safety rating to be on the calendar. Then I'll go Monaco and then Canada. Then there would be a French Grand Prix, but not at Paul Ricard. It would be instead at Manicor. The reason is, is because I think Manicor... Um, is a better track slightly for racing with that hairpin um, at the start of the lap at the end of the first sector. And then Austria, Silverstone, Hockenheim. And then the final race for me would be, before the summer break, Turkey. Now, Hungary has a lot of history and it does have good races, but Turkey's a better track. And with DRS that we have now, we would be guaranteed great races at Turkey, especially with, you know, drivers like Daniel Ricciardo on the grid, who would definitely go for dive bombs down the inside um, at the, I think it's turn 13 um, at that track. And then after the summer break, of course, you have Spa and Monza. And then instead of Singapore, I would go for a race track that's never been on the calendar. I would go Macau. The reason being is because all the young drivers that eventually come into F1, they love that track. They absolutely love it. Lewis Hamilton has spoke highly of it. And I think Lewis Hamilton in the past has come out and said that, you know, that's the track you'd love to be on the calendar that's never really going to be on the calendar. Then after that, I'd go for the Nürburgring. The reason they can't get a race um, on the calendar is because they don't have the money, but it'd be great to see a race back at that track. Then Malaysia, again, they don't have a race because of money. And then Kota, Mexico, and then the penultimate race would be Suzuka. 
And your final race would be Brazil. I think the final two races, if you know, if I was making the calendar, would have to be Suzuka and Brazil because they have so much history and something always happens at those tracks and it'd be such great tracks to end the season and to have possible uh, title deciders at. So Suzuka and Brazil for me would be the final two races on the calendar. But Nib, what what is your F1 calendar, your ideal F1 calendar? I'll let you uh, take it away. Well, starting off, we'll have my home Grand Prix at Albert Park in Melbourne. Then second of all, we'll have Bathurst. You know, some people might know might not know the Bathurst circuit, Mount Panorama in New South Wales. It's a brilliant track. They hold the the V8 Supercars Bathurst 1000 there over um, every year. They have the 12 hours of Bathurst as well. And if you've never seen the track, I highly suggest you go and check it out on YouTube. Go see a, a lap around there. And now third race would be China. China is such a good track. Personally, one of my favourites. It always produces good racing and overtaking. Fourth will be Bahrain. Exactly the same as China. Always, always good especially under the lights in the V6 uh, turbo era. It's always produced good racing. Uh, number five has to be Azerbaijan. After the first year that was on the calendar, <laughs> it wasn't looking very good. And then the past two years, wow, what a race it's delivered. So it deserves to keep its spot there with the fifth race of the season. Then number six, I'm going to go Austria for the first proper race of the European season. Number seven will be Monaco. And then we're going to go back to Turkey because I, I love Turkey as a track. I didn't have quite fond memories uh, from 2010 when Sebastian Vettel quite clearly uh, just hit Mark Webber out of the lead of the race. Um, so, yeah, I'd bring back Turkey, absolutely. Then ninth would be Silverstone and then Hockenheim and Hungary. Hungary is such a fantastic track in my opinion. I don't know how on earth... You have decided to get rid of it, Chaz, but but I'm sure you'll explain yourself a, a little bit more in depth when I challenge you on that in a moment. And then, of course, we'll have the summer break, and then we'll start off the second half of the season going to the Nürburgring. Such a brilliant track, but sadly, they just don't have the money to pay for the Grand Prix. Then the 13th race of the season would be at Zandvoort, because quite honestly, I'd love to see myself on, on the beach in the Netherlands, just having a very nice relaxed weekend. That would that would be a brilliant uh, brilliant weekend out. So that would be back on the calendar. And also, it's such it's such a historic track. It's been in F one from from the nineteen fifties or and sixties. So it'd be good to bring back some some classic tracks. That's for sure. And then we'd have our regular Spa and Monza races, and then. And then I'd go to Canada, uh, Circuit of Americas at Austin, Mexico, and then I'd go to Macau. Um, Macau is never, ever, ever going to be on the calendar. Um, we know that, but such a fantastic track, you know. Obviously, some people will know about Macau, but some people won't. But it's it's such a fantastic track. I really wish it could be on the calendar, it's sadly, because of the how well, there's absolutely no runoff area in most parts of the track that they, they wouldn't allow that. And then I'd love to see Malaysia back on the track. It was such a disappointment to see it leave, leave the calendar um, this season or the, this past season now, actually, but yeah, Malaysia would certainly be back, be back. That's for sure. And then the final two races of the season, the exact same as Chaz's would be Suzuka and Brazil. The two best tracks for me, to end the season, Suzuka just held so many great finale, finale races, and same as Brazil, you know, certainly the best, like, um, last race of the season that I can certainly remember as of, of recent history is the 2012 Brazilian Grand Prix, and then, of course, you got 2008 as well, so that that is my um, dream calendar list. I haven't quite put all of the tracks that I wanted in because you have you have to keep it in my opinion about from twenty to twenty three 
races. You can't I, once you're going over 23. I think you're having a bit too much. Um, but I also want to add out that, or oh, sorry, add in that I put the tracks in order. So you go from the Asia Pacific region, from Melbourne to Bahrain, and then you go through all your European races, Azerbaijan down to Monza, and then you go through your North American races, Canada, um, the American Grand Prix, Mexico, and then you then you go back to Asia for Macau, Malaysia, and Suzuka, and then back for, for your finale in Brazil. I think just logistically, we sometimes with the F1 calendar, it doesn't make a lot of sense, and that's one thing that I certainly wanted to put in my in my um in my wish list for the calendar. But yeah, now do you want do you maybe want to talk about why you've excluded a few of a, a few races of um when it comes to so the races that I've got rid of is Spain, uh Paul Ricard, Hungary, Russia and Abu Dhabi. Now with Spain it can be a good track and it is a very good track for testing, but I don't think it is as exciting of a track as Estoril, so that's why I you know, took that off. For Paul Ricard, the 2018 French Grand Prix at that track was so chaotic in terms of traffic and the racetrack, I think, was so horribly designed. So, yeah, I'd get rid of that track for Manny Core. Now, I know Hungary, you love that track, and this is the thing with Hungary you can get amazingly thrilling and exciting races at the Hungaro ring. But the thing with that track is it's either amazing or it's really, really boring. At Turkey, you kind of get more of a middle ground. Even if you don't get an exciting race, it's still going to be a pretty good one or, you know, a 6 out of 10 instead of a 2 out of 10. Hungary is either a 2 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10. So that's why I've gone with Turkey, because I think there's a better chance of consistently good races than there is at Hungary. And to be fair, Hungary normally is only good when it starts to rain. There are good races in the dry, but normally when it rains, then we do tend to get a great Hungarian Grand Prix. I don't think I need to get into why I've removed Russia. It's the worst track on the calendar by an absolute mile in Abu Dhabi. Even though the 2018 race was probably the second best race we've had at Abu Dhabi since it was introduced onto the calendar, it's an awful track and it doesn't deserve as a track to be on the calendar. So that's why I've got rid of those races but guys don't forget in the comments to put your ideal F1 calendar in. Make sure you put in um, it you know put the races in order, and also make sure um, you list how many races are in your calendar. I'm very interested to see one how many races you do you, you guys do have, and two what races you have because I think there are ones that uh, me and Nib have not thought of. You of course have Imola, that's one. I know people are going to go for the reason I haven't gone for Imola. Is because even though it was a good track, you never really got a thrilling race around there in terms of, you know, wheel-to-wheel -wheel battles. You had, of course, 2005, where Michael Schumacher was pressuring Fernando Alonso for so many laps. But because of the way the track was, he couldn't get past. If that battle took place on the track they have now at Imola without the final chicane, he probably would have got past. But... You know, that's just the way it is. Um, I can't think really of any other tracks we may have missed out on. If you look back at, say, classic race tracks, you've got uh, Argentina. That was a horrible track, though. You have, um, I can't remember the place it was called, but it was the Pacific Grand Prix. Again, I can't remember what uh, the name of the track was. You have Harath. Uh, Hareth, I don't think, is a good track for racing. It's too tight and there's too many corners. Um, Nib, do you, can you think of any races we may have missed out on? Um, Laguna Seca is, oh, a, is a race yeah. which I thought that, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'd want to see that on, on the calendar. No. Um, 
yeah, I don't think that would that race would be as good as people think. Of course, you know, Indianapolis, that track was good. It's just what happened in 2005 completely doomed that track in terms of F1 racing happening at that track. Um, you have, you know, the street races in America that we did have in Detroit, uh, Long Beach and... Um, other places Watkins I can't Glen. remember. Yeah, yeah, Watkins Glen. That used to be a racetrack, or is a racetrack, I think, in upstate New York, if I'm, um, if I'm not mistaken. So there's plenty of races in America, uh, Brazil. You have that track they used to race on before they redesigned the Interlagos track in Rio, but I don't think that track is really around anymore. Um, you have Mugello, which is used for MotoGP, so that will never happen. There's plenty of, I guess, you know, racetracks around, you know, Central Europe. But again, a lot of them, you just don't see races happening there. You you just, you, you really don't. And I think most of the races we have included um, have, you know, are the races that should make an F1 calendar and also... One race I forgot to mention as to why it's not on the calendar is Singapore. Now, Singapore, from a commercial uh, point of view, it's great because it looks so beautiful at night time and all the cars look great. But when it comes to racing, it's a, it's a horrible track. It's a horrible track. And you have to remember, this is our ideal F1 calendar. And in an ideal world, I would not have Singapore on my uh, calendar. But Nib, do you have anything else to cover when it comes to um, our Dream F1 calendar? Um, there's a few other tracks which we haven't mentioned. And of course, that's the like of the Korean Grand Prix, the Indian Grand Prix, the Valencian uh, straight track. You know, I, I really did like the Indian Grand Prix, but just people didn't turn up to the race. So they, they weren't able to keep that race. I also did really like the Korean Grand Prix track. It was a beautiful track to drive on the F1 game, that's for sure. And and I also didn't mind the Valencian Grand Prix. You know, we obviously had that terrific win by Fernando Alonso in 2012 where he started 13th, wasn't it? 13th. Um, I think it was 11th, but yeah, outside the 11th. top 10. A outside the top 10. And yeah, certainly one of Fernando's best drives. I think that race will always be remembered for that race win. Um, but no, there's not too many that I can really think about. And I've gotten rid of the exact same races of, as of you. Just I haven't gotten rid of Hungary because I believe Hungary is an absolutely brilliant track. And, you know, the race this year was actually pretty good there. We had some good battles outside while well, on the podium positions and in the midfield, it, it, it's just a it's good track for overtaking the last corner and then the first corner being the way it is. And then obviously you've got turn two where you've seen uh, Mr. Ricardo pull off some worldy overtakes <laughs> around the outside there. But yeah, I, I, I agree with getting rid of uh, Abu Dhabi. It's an awful, awful, awful track. Uh, you can't overtake it all. And that was pretty much shown by Fernando Alonso and him being stuck behind Vitaly Petrov. Oh, but geez, how many laps was it? It was well, it was certainly a long. I can't remember how many laps it was. Go, yeah, Russia's off. Spain, Spain's a very good test track, but I don't think over the past few years it's quite lived up to the track that it should be. Uh, the French Grand Prix at Paul Ricard, yeah, just been it. It, 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 it was okay. It was better than what I thought it was going to be. That's for sure. And. And then Singapore, yeah, it, it's great, you know, the night race, but yeah, it do, it doesn't produce great racing. So, yeah, I think I think that just about wraps us up on our dream F one calendars. Yeah, I think it does, and we'll now move on to our next topic, which is something very interesting to do with McLaren and actually quite big. Now, uh, with McLaren, it is rumored they are now bringing in a guy who was set to become the top of Porsche Motorsport, and his name is Andreas Seidel. Now, this guy was um, in charge of the LMP1 program, and he built the team in that series from scratch all the way up into 
um, the best LMP1 team until they withdrew from, um, you know, from that certain, um, you know, those certain cars and certain series. That's exactly what McLaren need. A, you know, a person who has experience at the top of motorsport, who is not connected to McLaren, who has experience also of building a team, a motorsport team from scratch, from bottom all the way up to the top, and is successful. If this is true, I am praying to the gods that he is going to be the team principal. I am praying that he is, because it would be great for McLaren if this guy took over. It really would, because again, he has that experience of winning and um, has the experience of building a big, I guess, team or manufacturer up from the bottom and building up towards the top. Uh, Nib, do you think that this can be a success for McLaren with this appointment if it is made? I think it can if they do make him the team principal and they give him what he needs to build the team, say, for the next five years and hopefully make them back in to a great team and a team winning races again. Yeah, I think if they are able to get this guy from Porsche that this would be one of McLaren's biggest coups, probably since they got Fernando Alonso to join. I really do think that this would be a massive, massive deal for um for McLaren. You know, um, what's his name? Andreas um, Seidel started off uh, Porsche's LMP1 return back in 2014. You know, he got he got the right drivers in place. He got Timo Bernard, Brendan Hartley, Mark Webber, of course, and in four years, they become the mo- the more dominant or the most dominant team in in the field. After well, certainly after uh, well, Audi and and Toyota weren't exactly at the top of their game for those years. So, and they won Le Mans, of course. Um, you know, he would he would be a really really good. He's he's very young. He's he's only forty two, so he's certainly got a lot of time and. Although he is unproven in Formula One, if he can do it in a in a sport which is probably even more complicated than Formula One, I, I don't see any reason why he can't do it with McLaren. And if they are able to pull off this signing, it, it will show a, a big um, sign of intent from McLaren and where they want to go back to. Yeah, hopefully they do pull it off because I, I think it'd be I think it would be massive. And again, hopefully they give this guy what he needs to you know to build a team, to get the right drivers in, a designer. Hopefully they are bringing in James Key. Hopefully that story is true. But just please bring in the right people with this guy because it is a sign of intent of where McLaren want to be. Um, in five years' time. They need to now start having a plan going forward, and it seems as though they've realised that and are now trying to do that. And that's what I said in my season review earlier this week. By the way, if you haven't checked it out, um, go onto my channel and you will uh, be able to find it. I said, if McLaren can have a plan of the next five years and where they want to be in 2024, then it's going to be better for them than having a short-term plan of, you know, oh, we're in the middle of this year, but let's be at the top of the field in, you know, 2019, when it's very unrealistic that such a thing is going to happen. Do what Renault did, have a plan of where you want to be in a few years' time, and try and work towards that instead of such unrealistic targets, which are not going to happen. So hopefully that is um, going to happen for McLaren. Hopefully they do improve in terms of the operational side of things um, in 2019 with, hopefully, this um, appointment. But the last topic, and another interesting one, is me and Nib are going to get into, and make sure as well, in the comments section, you also uh, put your answers down below. Who is the best team principal or team boss in the history of F? One Now, I'm going to get into my list of team principles, and it's pretty much the same as Nibs, uh, but basically we are only deciding who the best uh, team boss is. 
So the team principles really to pick from are Colin Chapman, of course, a guy who built up Lotus and designed the cars, of course. Uh, Frank Williams, need I say any more? Ron Dennis, also, need I say any more? Flavio Briatore. Now, when it comes to him, forget uh, Crashgate. We are not basing it off Crashgate. So please forget that. We, we When it comes to him being on the list, I'm only basing it off his four championships in 94, 95, um, and 2005 and 2006. Of course, 94, Benetton didn't win the Constructors, but you know Michael Schumacher did win the 94 Drivers title with the team. Jean Tart, that's a very, very good choice right there. Ross Braun and Christian Horner. So, who are we going to go with? With our best team boss in the history of F1. It's very difficult for me to choose. I'm going to go for a top three. So in third place, I am going to go with Ron Dennis. Now, you know, Ron Dennis was massively successful in the 80s especially. And the 90s and some of the 2000s. But the reason I'm going to rank him only in third is because... Of Spygate, I think that really did damage his reputation, and he could have done more to protect his team from what happened to them being suspended from the constructors in 2007 and being given a hundred million dollar fine. And well, the reason McLaren are in the trouble they are in is because of Ron Dennis, he wanted the McLaren Honda partnership to return, it did. It failed, and that's why McLaren are in this position and don't have the Mercedes power units anymore, which, even though McLaren don't have that good of a chassis, of course, if they had Mercedes engines, that would solve a lot of their issues. It really, really would. So, you know, that's why I put Ron Dennis in third. In second place for me is Frank Williams. Now... Of course, Frank, ever since he formed the you know the Williams team as we know today as proper in the late 70s, he was so successful in the 80s and 90s. But the reason I only rank him as second is because despite all of that success, and he deserves all the accolades for that success, um, what, ha what has happened since 1998, he is responsible for as well as Claire Williams and Patrick Head and all of the other top people that have been in the team since 1998. You know, signing drivers instead of other drivers, putting certain people in place. I think he could have made better decisions, um, but you cannot deny, you know, for him to win nine Constructors titles in 17 years, that is what? That's one Constructors title every two years, I think. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing to think. But I'm only going to go for him in second. But my best team boss of all time is Jean Tot. The reason being is because he turned Ferrari, who were an absolute mess in 1993 and were a laughing stock of F1. If that Ferrari team was around today, there'd be a meme. They were that bad. They were just so bad at everything. Pit stops... You know, designing the car, their engine was awful in terms of reliability and actual power. Everything about that team was poor. And also the driver lineup. He turned that team from what was basically a midfield team in 1993 into probably the most dominant winning machine we maybe have ever seen in the sport from 1999 until 2004. With Michael Schumacher winning five drivers' titles and then winning six constructors' titles in a row. The only team that can I can think of that can rival that is, you know, Mercedes right now. But when it comes to their team boss, which I'll get onto in a minute, I don't think Toto Wolf has as much to do with that success as people may think. But for me, Jean Tot is the best team boss of all time because he turned Ferrari with all the pressure of turning Ferrari into or going from a midfield team 
at, you know, that should should have been doing a lot better into the most dominant winning machine we have possibly ever seen. So, Nib, what is your top three team bosses of all time? I'm very interested to hear this. Well, my top three is just slightly different to yours. Um, in third place, I am, in fact, going to go with Jean Todd. Um, as you just mentioned, he turned Ferrari from an utter, utter shambles that it was in the early 90s into the powerhouse and incredible company and Formula One team it is today, although it hasn't been so incredible uh, the past, say, the past 10 years. Uh, yeah, probably the past 10 years since he left, actually. Um, he still turned into an incredible, incredible team and the most the most successful team in Formula One. So you have to go with Jean Todd there. And in second place, I'm going to go with Ron Dennis. You know, he he single-handedly, single-handedly, yeah, um, brought brought McLaren from from really not a top team. You know, they're a very solid team, but they weren't the top, top team. And, and the job that Ron Dennis did for, tw- I think it was 28 years until the end of 2008 when Martin Whitmarsh took over was absolutely brilliant. You know, as you mentioned, Spygate certainly did hamper um, his reputation in, in the eyes of pretty much everyone. Um, but the, the job he did in, in the 80s and the 90s, managing somehow Senna and Prost at, for major, pretty well the, for the majority of the time, he, he was a fantastic uh, dictator the, the the best dictator in the world of Formula One, and for that reason, he is going to go in second place. And for me, in first place, it has to be Sir Frank Williams. Um, you know the the job that him and Patrick Head did to even keep the team afloat in the mid seventies was absolutely incredible. You know how how the team is still around today is is somewhat of a miracle, especially after. Uh, Frank's awful car accident that he had in France in the mid-80s. The most successful team principal of all time. And for me, it's it's very hard to go past. But there is one thing I must say. I, I'm certainly not as clued up on, on my Formula 1 history as I need to be and as Chaz is. So my, my opinion could still change on that on that top three in in as in uh, as time goes along but for me currently at the moment Christian Horner is certainly by far way the best uh, team principal in the sport um, and and as Chaz mentioned I don't think Toto Wolf is I, I don't think he can even really say he's a team principal he's not your your stereotypical team principal you know who sits on the pit wall like Ron Dennis or or Jean Todd, you know, or Flavio Briatore, you know, he isn't on the pit wall controlling everything. He sits in the garage, all nice and relaxed, and and yeah, obviously he makes some very big calls as we've seen in Russia the past season, you know. But I don't think he is quite as good as Christian Horner. Christian Horner is not only brilliant. With his decision making and stuff like that, he he talks so well, and I'm not saying that Toto doesn't talk well, but to- Toto is more for the business side of things. That's why he was brought in from Williams um, at the at the was he got brought in 2014, wasn't it? So yeah, I think I think Toto isn't quite um, worthy of being on that list. Yeah, when it comes to Toto Wolf, the reason I don't you know, rank him really highly at all is because the reason Mercedes uh, started dominating or, or are dominating the sport is because Ross Braun put the people in place for Mercedes to dominate from 2014 on. And you also have to remember, without Ross Braun, they would not have been um, even a team at that certain base because... If he decided not to uh, buy the team and call it Braun GP and have it be his team for a year, 
then maybe Mercedes would not have bought that team and turned that team into the winning machine it is. So Ross Braun, for me, has to be someone that you have to shout out as one of the best team principals of all time. I know he only won one Constructors title and he was only a team principal for, what, four years? But without him, the team from Brackley... They wouldn't be an F1 team. They would be... It'd be like Lotus after they went out of business in 95. It would be a team that used to be there but is no longer a racing team. So Ross Braun has to be mentioned. And as well as Nib says, Christian Horner. For me, Horner is the best on the grid. And basically for the reasons that Nib has mentioned. And when it comes to Toto Wolf. For me, when it comes to Toto, he hasn't been tested yet. Let's see when Mercedes, and they will, eventually drop off the pace and cannot win a championship anymore. Let's see how good he is then and whether he can build the team back up to that title winning level like Ron Dennis did. You know, Ron Dennis had to build that team, uh, I think it was 81, up to a title winning level in 84. And then after they stopped dominating with Honda... It took him a long time, from 92 until 98, to get that team back into a championship winning position. So, Ron Dennis, he was able to do it, and that's why he's so great. Jean Tart, of course. Uh, Frank Williams had to do it in the late 80s, early 90s. And even though, after 97, Williams have not won a championship, he had to build the team again through 98, 99 and 2000. For the team to be able to possibly challenge for one in 2003, I think it was. So Frank Williams, that's why he's up there. So Toto Wolf, when it comes to him, let's see what happens when the going gets tough and whether the tough get going. But that is it for the podcast, basically. Those are the three topics. And I would say those were some brilliant topics. And hopefully you guys have interacted in the comments about who your best team principals are of all time, and also your ideal F1 calendar and what you think about Andreas Seidel, possibly going to McLaren, how big of a news that is. But Nib, thank you as ever for coming along to the podcast as ever. Yeah, thanks, mate. And of course, we have to thank you for being here. And of course, thank you to everyone in the comments. You've made any comments for you. Continue to support. And even if you don't leave a comment, you know, thanks, thanks for watching. And, and, you know, maybe if you, if you don't drop a comment, you know, maybe think about it, you know, just, just get involved in the conversation because we are always happy to, to be involved in the conversation. Yeah. If you comment down below, there's a great chance that either me or Nib are, go are going to reply and interact. So don't hesitate to post a comment, but that is it for this podcast. And I just need to let you guys know the podcast next Saturday will be live because it will be our Christmas special. And I do have some very special news. Maybe you could call it a Christmas present to give to you guys on the 22nd of December. But as ever, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to like this video. Comment down below what you thought about the topics we discussed. Don't forget to join our Discord server. As also... Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you're new to the channel. We will be doing uh, podcast episodes every weekend. There is not an F1 race, so make sure to subscribe to the channel if you are new. Either do it on the bottom right of the screen or, glow, or go sorry, to my channel page and subscribe to the channel. Also, don't forget to follow me on Twitter and check out my website, chazrhd.com. But until the next podcast, next Saturday, the Christmas special, it's been me, Shazer HD, goodbye.